Am I good? Good? Nice. All right. Oh, Tom, could you hand me those notes right there? I apologize. Yes. <laughs> grace, the grace of God. My bad. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our service this morning. It's a blessing to be here, a blessing to be able to preach today. Thank you for this opportunity. Before I get started with the sermon today, I, uh, I wanted to give an update on our youth group. So, um, my philosophy, my goal with the youth is to help them build a firm foundation in Jesus that lasts for life. See, what happens nowadays a lot is that once kids graduate high school, um, they'll walk away from the faith. And it used to be that they would come back when they had children and got married and things like that. But it's happening more and more where people aren't coming back to the church. So my goal is to help the youth build a firm foundation in Christ Jesus that lasts for life. And so through the good the bad, the amazing, and all things, they know that they have a God who loves them, who wants a relationship with them, and will be with them eternally in his glory. Amen? All right. So, um, let's see. Sorry, i got to get situated here. I apologize. Where am I at? Okay. That's not what I was looking at. There we go. There we go. Okay, uh, parents, September 12th, we have a parent meeting after the service, so please come and join us. We're going to give you a calendar for our youth, what we're going to do for the fall semester, September 12th, after the 10 a.m. service. Okay, before I get into sermon, let's pray, please. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for what you have done for us. Thank you that we have an opportunity to gather, to worship you, to learn from you. God, I pray that you give me words to speak, and I pray that uh, your truth carries us through the week and through our lives. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, so if you have your Bibles, please open them there. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And here's what it says. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We're the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, guys, we've been talking about covenant relationship, and we've seen that God spoke to Moses. We have seen that God spoke to Abraham, and we see in this passage that God has spoken to various people in different ways. But in the last days, in the final days, God spoke through Jesus. Now, who is Jesus? We find in the passage that he is the heir. He is the radiance of God's glory. He is the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Jesus is God himself. In the last days, God himself spoke to us. So what we find in this passage is two things. One, God desires a relationship with you. We see it throughout scripture and we see it here. God desires an intimate, personal relationship with us. God desires an intimate, personal relationship with us. And two, there's a finality here. In the final days, there's a finality here. This is the way it is and that's it. There's an understanding that God spoke in the most supreme way through Jesus. There's an unchanging truth about this expression. 
out of all the previous ways that God has spoken, there's no fuller expression than the way he spoke through Jesus. So again, we have God wants a relationship with us, and this is the way it is. Now, this might sound like a bit of a contradiction to some of us. How can he want a relationship with us, but then he gives us this sort of ultimatum here, this non-negotiable? What is that? Well, I would argue that all intimate relationships have finalities, things that this is the way it is. And we must adapt to these truths if we want to maintain an intimate relationship. Let me give an example. Well, we love each other, don't we? Let's get married. And so you get married, and soon enough you realize that the person you love contradicts you. They challenge you. They go against your will. They say things maybe you don't want to hear. And so you make a choice. I want to maintain this relationship. And you figure, well, everything's negotiable. Let's negotiate things. But you realize who you married. And so you realize, okay, they are going to contradict me. They're going to say things I don't like. They're different than I am. They have their own personality. And so I must adapt. And also they must adapt to us. There are finalities about us, and this is true with parents, children, grandparents, and children. Now, let's look at the other side of the coin, okay? Let's pretend then they didn't have finalities. They did everything we wanted. The person you love obeys everything you say. They always take out the trash. You never have to ask. They always do the dishes. Your food is ready whenever you want it. You never have to ask. They never have a thought of their own. Everything is perfect the way you want it. And for some of us, are like, oh, yeah, let's do that. That sounds good. But what do we lose with that when someone, you can't have a real conversation? You lose intimacy. We lose real relationship. A real intimate relationship is lost. Now, why am I talking about this? What, what does this have to do with God? You know, when it comes to relationships, what I was just talking about, there is this idea of that we lose the relationship. There's this microchipping, this appliance, this person who's no longer real to us. It's just somebody doing something for us. And when it comes to God, today people will say things like, I'm spiritual. You know, I, I believe that God loves, but I just, I just can't accept this thing about judgment. I just don't like that idea. I believe that there's a God. I just can't accept what the Bible says. And, you know, one has the freedom to believe what they want, and they should be able to express what they believe. But then the question comes, have we microchipped our God? Has our God become an appliance? Does our God challenge us? Does our God contradict us to become better human beings? Does our God go against our will? Or does he, agree, does he agree with everything we believe? Does he contradict our modern day sensibilities? Or is he just a yes man? The reality is that our God has finalities. This is the way it is and that is it. And we have to adapt to him to become into deep relationship with our God. This is the way it is. Now someone my counter. Hold on, Edgar. I don't really like this. This isn't fair. Why is it that I have to adapt to God? Why can't God adapt to me? That's a fair question. Honestly, it's a fair question. It doesn't seem like it's a fair question. It sounds a little bit heretical. Like, what, you mean? what do you mean God has to adapt to you? Who are you? He's God. And I got this idea from Tim Keller. I kind of got this, the beginning of this sermon from Tim Keller. And I would argue that God did adapt to us. He did. There's a finality about us. There's a truth about us that is. We are sinners. We are sinners. And God met us in our most deepest need in order to make a way that we may have relationship with him. Philippians 2.6 
3.11. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus came from his high status, from the creator of the world, from his throne. He came down to earth to meet us at our most deepest need. In our brokenness, Jesus met us. He did this that we may have relationship with him. And because he did this, he is exalted at the right hand of the Father. Praise be to God that he is able to bring us into relationship with himself. Thank you, Jesus. We can come into relationship, deep, intimate, personal relationship because of what Jesus has done. Now, I'm going to look at Hebrews 8, dig deeper into what this means. What all did Jesus do for us? Um, because Hebrews 2 tells us that we must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so we do not drift away. Guys, let's fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us know him better. So I'm going to go to uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. And it says... Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. Every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. Since the new covenant is established on better promises. Now I'm going to talk about uh, verse 1 real quick. It says, now the main point of what we are saying is this. Here's the main point. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty. So that's some explaining that I'm going to do real quick, okay? So we talk about the priesthood. We talk about kingship. The reason we're doing this is so we can dig deeper into what Jesus did, so we can understand what he did to bring us into relationship with him, okay? So in the Old Test- in time of the Old Testament law, there's a high priest and there was a king. But you never had a priest be king. That just wasn't a thing. You were either priest or you were king. And if you were priest, um, you came from the line of Aaron. And what did the priest do? The priest was appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So that was the job of the priest. Okay? Now, Jesus did not come from the line of Aaron. So how can he be priest if he's not from the line of Aaron? There is this mysterious figure in the Old Testament uh, in Genesis to whom Abraham gave his tithe, Melchizedek. Now Melchizedek was both priest and he was king. He was king. He was the king of righteousness. Well, Jesus is righteous. He never sinned. He is the king of, of peace. And Jesus offers peace to us. And then, in the Psalms, we see that there's a prophecy about the coming Messiah, one who will come in the order of Melchizedek, priest forever. So, who is this person? This is Jesus. Jesus is the priest king. He is the priest forever forever in the order of Melchizedek. And earlier, I talked about how the priest offers sacrifices year after year. That's what he does. He offers sacrifices year after year, but Jesus had to only offer one sacrifice, and that is himself. 
Jesus gave the one and only sacrifice. And on this passage, we find that he is seated. So why is Jesus seated? Well, he's seated because his work is done. Unlike the high priest who did it year after year, he would come into the Holy of Holies in the presence of God one time every year. Jesus had only do it once forever. He is priest forever. So he's seated because his work as high priest is done. And he's also seated because he is king. In the scriptures, we find that everyone who comes before the Lord bows down before the Lord, but not Jesus. Jesus is at the right hand of the throne. He is king. He has authority, and he will establish his kingdom. And we also find that Jesus is the one who is interceding for us, and he has authority to forgive sins. Praise be to God. He made a way. Okay. Now, in verse 2, there's something that uh, I really, really kind of enjoyed about this passage. It says, and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by mere human beings. Jesus at the true tabernacle, the true sanctuary. See, um, the other verses say that the other stuff was built by human hands. It was a copy and a shadow of the real thing, a copy and a shadow. Now, let's talk about copies and shadows. I have a friend. Uh, when I was in seminary, his wife... Uh, lived in a different country. He lived here. His wife lived in a different country. And, you know, they weren't in disagreement with each other. They loved each other. But it just so happened to be that he had to live here and she had to live there. So what do you do when you're in long distance? You call each other. You talk on the video phone. You uh, FaceTime each other. You text each other. I don't know if they write, wrote letters to each other. They sent gifts to each other. Things like that. But it's only a shadow. Having somebody far away from you is very, very different than having the real fullness of the person right before you. It's very, very different. Many of us have worked in offices, and when you go to somebody's office, you might find a picture of loved ones, family, children. And that picture is a copy of the real thing. That picture is not the real person. It points us to the real person. And so it is with the tabernacle of sanctuary. It's not the fullness. It's something made by human hands. It's not the kingship of God in its fullness. Guys, let us not worship the copies and the shadows. Let us worship God. The things that God has created in this world are meant to point us to him. Let us not obsess about the things that are not him. So we have Jesus now. How is his priesthood superior to the one of the high priest of the line of Aaron? How is his priesthood superior? Well, I'm glad you asked. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear before us in God's presence. Jesus entered the true tabernacle, the full presence of God offering himself offering himself for our sake. Jesus was at the presence of God. And he didn't offer an animal. He offered himself, the blood of Christ God. A true tabernacle. And what happened? We find in Matthew that when Jesus gave his life, the, the, um, the veil was torn. So the place where the high priest would go in once a year now it's torn, and now we have access to the presence of God. The high priest could only go there, but now we can go in the presence of God year after year. Thanks be to God that he made a way. The temple veil was torn, and now we can come into the presence of God and have relationship with him. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, open for us to the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, and let's draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. We can enter the most holy place, the holy of holies, because of what Jesus Christ did. The veil was torn. The barrier between God and humans has been removed. 
The sin that separates us from God has been removed, and praise be to Jesus, we can come into full relationship with him. All right. Now we come into the idea of covenant. Okay, so uh, Hebrews chapter 8, 10 through 13. Hebrews chapter 8, 10 through 13. This is the covenant I will establish with, my, with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least to the greatest. For I'll forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete, and what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. Earlier, I talked about finalities. God created a way, and this is it. He has made a way for us to have relationship with him. God wants a true relationship with you, and there's nothing that we can do to work our way into salvation. It is done by God and is fulfilled by God. There's no work we can do to turn salvation. Jesus calls us instead into covenant. He says, here is what I did for you. Come into this covenant relationship of love and law, and it is binding, and we live into it. And what does this covenant and relationship entail? According to this passage, there's three things we gather. One, he will remember our sins no more. Two, we will know him. He'll remember our sins no more, and we will know him. And three, he'll put his laws in our hearts. Because he gave his life for us. Our sins are forgiven. And because our sins are forgiven, we can enter the Holy of Holies. We can be in the presence of God and we can know him. We can have a real personal relationship with God. And because we can know him, we can know what he desires of us, what he wills for us to do. We can have a real relationship with him. When you know somebody, you know what they want. You know what their heart desires. We can come into real relationship with Jesus and we can know what he desires for us. We can know his laws. And we don't do, we don't obey because we think we're going to earn salvation. We do it because we love him. What are his laws? To love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. We obey because we love him. We adapt to him because he is God and we are his people. He is our Lord. Now, uh, what does it mean? How, how can I love God? I, I, what does it mean that I don't have, can't earn my way to salvation? I can't just work and get it done? No, it's a, it's a higher way. It's the better way. It's, it's a way that is out of love in Christ. I'll give an example. Um, anybody here seen the movie Cinderella Man? Cinderella Man, the movie? Okay. If you've seen it, it's, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, sorry, if you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a good movie. I like it. So Cinderella Man, it's about a boxer who lived in the time of the Great Depression, okay? So he boxed, and for some reason, he wasn't able to box anymore. And uh, it was the Great Depression. He had a family, he had a kid, so he had to provide for his family and provide for himself. But times were hard. Times were very, very difficult. It was difficulty finding regular work, right? Couldn't provide. There was not enough food. It was cold. cared for his children, they get sick. It was hard, how to get on government assistance. Things were not good. Things were not good. But at some point during this movie, he got another chance to box. And so he did. And something that I liked about this movie, there was a point in the movie where like, as he's fighting, there's a flashback. And the flashback takes him to the difficulties of providing for his family the difficulty that he faced in his Great Depression, or he's facing in his Great Depression. It's hard. He does not want to see his family suffer. And he's thinking about his family, and his love for his family made him fight harder. Guys, how much more us who have the love of God in our hearts, how much more can we go on stronger living into what God has called us to live. Out of love, that boxer fought. He went. He did for his family. Out of love for Christ, 
we can live into what God has called us to. And he gives us strength. He gives us his Holy Spirit because we know him and we know his laws. And he will help us move into the eternal with him. We will run the race marked out for us because God gives us the strength to do. Okay, but you're still my question. Okay, what are these laws? What is, what is, what is this? Is the Old Testament laws? What's going on here? I don't... I mean, if I know him, what is he asking me to do? To love God? Okay, what does that mean? Do we still follow the Old Testament laws? Uh, I'm going to give a brief summary of the Old Testament laws because I know some people might have questions about it. This is brief. There's more to it. If you want to discuss it later, we can. So the Old Testament laws really can be broken down uh, into three categories. Uh, this is a summary again. There's the moral law, the ceremonial law, and the cultural law. Okay, so with the moral law, it still stands. The Old Testament moral law still stands. We don't do it to earn salvation. We do it because we love God, okay? Second, the ceremonial law, the laws of sacrifice and temple and things like that, that has been fulfilled by Jesus. It's been fulfilled. And now you have these other interesting laws, like don't eat certain types of foods or uh, the way you look and the way you should dress, things like that. What do we do with those things? Well, what I find in this scripture is that there are truths that can be found in there. There are truths. So these, these cultural laws are, are specific to a culture and a time. But there is a truth that can be found in there. So I'll give you an example, right? Uh, we get on the highway. There's a law that you can't go over the speed limit, 60, 70, 80, wherever you are. You can't go over that speed limit. If I take that law and I place it into the first century... They're going to be like, what's going on here? What is, first of all, what are miles? What's speed limit? Are you guys riding cheetahs? What's going on? Right? Doesn't make sense. But the reason that the 60 mile an hour law is there is for safety. There's a fundamental truth that is there. So if you look at the laws of the Old Testament, the cultural laws, there's a fundamental truth that can be found. Don't eat these foods. Well, we don't have, they didn't have modern day doctors. You could die if you eat certain types of foods. Hey, dress this way, look this way. We are people set apart. There are truths there that we can find. So, that's just a little summary of everything. But, going back to the idea, right? Jesus forgives our sins. We know God, and because we know him, because we can come into relationship with him, we will know what he desires for our lives. And so what does he desire? Again, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that, almost finishing up, brings me to, in a practical sense, well, how do we love God? How do we do it? I, uh, one of my favorite passages is in, in Matthew, where he talks about making disciples of all nations, baptizing nations, baptizing them in the baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he has commanded, right? So we forget about teaching people to obey. So what has Jesus commanded? How do we live into what God has called us to? Out of love, out of love for God. We make disciples, we baptize, we obey, we love, we speak truth, we speak truth. We remain faithful, we forgive, we repent, we follow him. We let the light of God shine. We love our enemies and we pray for those who persecute us. We seek the kingdom. We impart justice. We beware of false prophets. We honor our parents. We deny ourselves. We rejoice. We love him. How can we really love him then? coming back to Hebrews 2. We must pay careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so we do not drift away. We've heard the message of Jesus, and we focus on the gospel of Jesus. We obsess about the gospel because we, it gets us closer to knowing him. And how do we come closer to him in our daily lives? How do we continue to obey him? How do we continue to know him? Well, we pray, we come together, we worship. Thank you, by the way. Great worship. We serve, we put God first, we practice the spiritual disciplines, we pray, we, we invite others to share life with us, and we recognize, we continue 
the good fight, recognizing that we will be with God in the eternal. Let us live into what God has called us to because we know him. We have been forgiven. We can be in relationship with him. He has called us into relationship. And knowing him, we will know what he desires. And we recognize that one day we will be with him in eternity. Not because of works, but because of this binding covenant of grace. Initiated, fulfilled by Jesus. This is the way it is, and that's it. Now to end, if you want to come into relationship with Jesus, please do. If we have made our God into a yes man, into an appliance, if we've microchipped our God, let's step away from that. Let's come into real relationship with Jesus. Adapt to him. And if you already know Jesus, again, let's pay careful attention to the gospel that we have heard so we don't drift away. He loves you. He saves you. He wants a real, intimate, personal relationship with you. And he will help us throughout so we are in eternity with him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have given us a way to come into full relationship with you, not by works, but by grace. There's nothing we can do. God, I pray that we may come into relationship and that we get to know you more and live into your kingdom. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.